Graphic design history has a problem. Much of it is either ending up in dumpsters or going unrecognized because it doesn't fit into the established canon or idea of what graphic design is. Without the proper archives and a diversity of materials and voices, much of graphic design history will disappear. But we have a solution. The People's Graphic Design Archive, a digital archive by everyone, about everyone, for everyone. This archive is different. The People's Graphic Design Archive includes not just finished products, but process, photos, videos, letters, documents, oral histories, anecdotes, articles, essays, and other writings. And best of all, it's created by us, the people. There are many types and combinations of visitors. They can browse or do a search for specific content. Entries feature subject, format, medium, designer, and date, along with other related information. Share, make sets, and leave comments if you have more to add to the story. The People's Graphic Design Archive is for research, education, inspiration, or just pure joy. We need your help to make the archive a reality. Join us in building the People's Graphic Design Archive. And I think that you have to recognize that because I am not white and because I'm not a male that I am not going to get the blessings of the power structure in this country. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining us today. 
I'm Michael Ellsworth of the Seattle Design Practice Civilization, and we're extremely honored when our friends at Design for America reached out to us to be a part of their closing weekly webinar, the Spark Series. Thank you. Uh, the goal of their series is to bring design inspiration and innovation to their community, and the goal of our practice is making design education accessible to our community. Six years ago, our studio started the Design Lecture Series uh, in Seattle, where we bring graphic designers from the, around the world to speak to our design community. A few years later, we opened Non-Breaking Space, an exhibition space focused on promoting works of visual communication. I'm in our studio right now in Seattle. And due to the current circumstances, we had to cancel this year's events and board up our gallery. So we're very excited to be a part of this today. I want to thank you all for joining us, and I want to thank our generous partners for continuously helping us support our events, um, Blue Dot, Hemlock Printers, and Mohawk Paper. Thank you for helping us out with this. And again, I want to thank Design for America for making this all happen. So real quick, run a show. Um, soon I'll be sending it, over, turning it over to Saki, who's joining us from Zimbabwe. Saki Mafundakwa is a graphic designer, filmmaker, art director, and design educator. He founded the Zimbabwe Institute of Visual Arts, Ziva, in 1998. Ziva is a design and new media training college in Zimbabwe. He has an MFA in graphic design from Yale University. His book, African Alphabets, The Story of Writing in Africa, was published in 2004. It was the first and only book on African typography, and Saki leads workshops and lectures globally. We're very happy to have him with us today. Thank you, Saki. And after Saki's presentation, it'll be followed by Sadie's. Um, Sadie Redwing is a Lakota graphic designer and advocate from the Spirit Lake Dakota tribe. She earned her BFA in New Media Arts and Interactive Design at the Institute of American Indian Arts. She received her Master's of Graphic Design from North Carolina State University. Her research on cultural revitalization through design tools and strategies created a new demand for tribal competency in graphic design research. And I want to thank Sadie for joining us today from North Dakota. Their presentations uh, will be followed by a Q&A that's moderated by Hugh Weber. Hugh is the managing director at both The Great Discontent and Design Observer. Thank you, Hugh, for moderating today. And he will be posing the questions that you all submit in the chat feature. Thanks again for tuning in, spending this time with us. And I will now turn it over to Saki Mifundikwa. Thank you. But uh, it's great to be here. Uh, I'm in very good company. Um, Civilization, Sadie, and DFA. Thank you for having us. So we only have kind of like 15 minutes. But uh, I have a lecture that uh, is like 30 minutes, so we're going to try to do some, <laughs> some match there uh, with this. Let me share my screen. Okay. So, so I'm from Zimbabwe, and the, this map here just shows where Zimbabwe is on the continent of Africa. I am a long way away from Seattle, where I was just two weeks ago. And um, you, okay, good. You see my slides, right? Cool. So Zimbabwe got its name from this structure here, which, is, which was built by the Shona people in the 11th century. Um, it's like this great city where like 20,000 people at its height, 20,000 people lived there. Um, it's a design, engineering, and architectural wonder. All these granite um, blocks that you see are not held together by mortar, okay? They're just standing free. So how that was done is still a mystery, but uh, that's uh, African ingenuity and innovation right there. And this is my city, it's called Harare. It means the one that doesn't sleep. And before COVID, we actually lived up to that name. We just partied all night long. And um, this, this, what you see here is called Africa Unit, uh, Unity Square. And the jacarandas are in full bloom, which is our spring in September. So 
I moved back home from uh, a very successful design career in New York City and uh, started a school called the Zimbabwe Institute, Institute of Digital Arts. And I think digital is pretty self-explanatory. Visual arts taught using digital tools. And these are it's my favorite shot of my students together. And the work that we do there, this is the class that I teach typography, which is my thing, my favorite thing. And the brief here was basically design uh, an alphabet from nature. And this is, um, I'll just share with you some samples of work from, from Ziva. This was a, 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 a poster design workshop uh, run by uh, a very amazing poster designer from Heidelberg in Germany. His name is Gertz Gramlich, and it was part of the Poster for Tomorrow initiative. Poster for Tomorrow is a Paris-based initiative that goes around the world uh, with themes for students to create posters and logos designed by Ziva students. These posters were designed at Cornish uh, when I moved to Seattle, thanks to civilization. Civilization brought me to Seattle for a lecture, the lectures that uh, Michael just talked about, and I never left for two years. And I taught at Cornish College of the Arts, and the class was called Design for Social Activism. And I took that uh, workshop to upstate New York, to Binghamton, uh, university where there were Chinese students in the class and they asked if they could do their posters uh, in, in Chinese and I said sure why not and and this was their interpretation of the 70th uh, celebration of the 70th uh, anniversary of the launching of the human rights uh, UN uh, human rights uh, declaration of human rights and I wrote a book, the book that Michael talked about was published in 2004, uh, African Alphabets. Actually started as my uh, thesis at Yale, uh, where I discovered the existence of um, writing systems that were devi uh, devised and invented by Africans in Sub-Saharan Africa, which was something that even I didn't know about uh, due to pretty much colonization. You know, we're not supposed to know about these achievements by Africans. And in the book, uh, one of the, my favorite uh, chapters is uh, about King Ibrahim Joya, who is at the age of 25, uh, designed a, a writing system for his people, the Bamum people. And during the uh, research part of the, of of my book, the Richard uh, research process, I actually traveled to Cameroon and I met his grandson who was keeping his uh, gr gr grandfather's uh, achievements and memory alive. And so this is the writing systems with the three sort of like iterations that went through in 30 years. At the bottom is the uh, current, um, uh, writing system and it's a syllabary whereby each symbol stands for a uh, for a syllable. I love this pictograph is from the Joker people of Angola and it's called the creation basically how uh, humanity was created. And Adinkra symbols of the Akan people of Ghana and Cote d'Ivoire uh, are also very popular on the continent uh, and beyond. Uh, they were created uh, like uh, uh, over 400 years ago. And they are proverbs or sayings, you know, important sayings uh, by the Akan people, which is writing, of course, it's a form of symbol writing. And then in South Africa, uh, when I wrote the book, I thought this was called Bantu symbol writing, but it's actually Nguni symbol writing named after the people who devised the writing system. The main part of uh, my presentation uh, this evening is really decolonizing decolonization. The thesis here, the thinking is that like uh, decolonize, decolonization has become the buzzword in design, especially design education. 
And I'm saying we, the people from around the world, from areas where uh, we were colonized, really should be the people who sort of lead that um, movement, that debate for colonization. Because you can't have the people from who were the colonizers uh, leading that debate. Because when you say decolonize design, what are you replacing it with? You know, yet we have the um, those tools, uh, that ability to lead that uh, conversation. So this was my textbook, uh, my foundation textbook, by a Swiss. Uh, it's a Swiss book on the Swiss tradition and design. And I'm saying that uh, I actually have the, um, I'm working on a textbook, by the way, for African students, so that when we say decolonization, they say, okay, so what are we decolonizing to, right? So until that book is written, we rely on uh, books that are already out there uh, and these are some of the books that I have on my bookshelf. And uh, like Cuba, the Cuba people of Congo create these Cuba cloths that are globally famous. You know, people love these to hang in, the, um, in their living rooms. And I say we could actually, rather than the book that I showed you, the Swiss book, uh, we could create uh, graphic exercises uh, based on the Cuba designs. These are the Cuba people. Uh, these are the artists. These are Africa's uh, visionaries, you know, who created uh, African design. And in the, still in the Congo, we find the Mbuti people who live in the Turi rainforest. They paint on bark cloth, which they create from the bark of uh, certain trees and using pigments from flowers and, and, and other uh, liquids from trees and so forth. They create these um, amazing uh, designs, which I call pretty much non-Western uh, visual, uh, uh, data visualization. And these are some of the, uh, the, the graphics from the, the, the painting. These are logos from, um, Arizona in America. Basically these are Native American and all based on gaming. And um, on the left here, you see the checkered pattern, which is pretty much global. It's available, it's found in different uh, parts of the world and all has to do with ge uh, genealogy is the graphics on the, on the right side, my right here also. On the left is uh, abstract writing from Abaqua, which is a secret uh, society in Cuba. But the, the symbols and the style come from Nigeria, the Nsibidi in uh, by the ethnic people in uh, Southwestern Nigeria. And on the left, again, uh, symbols uh, from ancient times at the top is the human figure in the middle is a reptile, and at the bottom is a avian birds genealogy. And then the Luba people, still in the Congo, I find the Congo people to be <laughs> pretty amazing innovators and uh, designers. Uh, the Lokasa, it's a divination board, memory device, an African tablet dating way back into antiquity, predating the iPad by centuries. So a Lucasa serves as an archive for the topo topographical and chronological mapping of political histories and other data sets. 
I guess, the only drawback of the Lucasa board. In terms of the engineering and the ingenuity, I think it's on par with the, uh, with, uh, the modern day tablets, uh, including you see how the, uh, all these beads and uh, things around here. That looks like a, a memory board. If you open the, your iPad, you'll find there's all kinds of like uh, electronics in there. It's pretty much the same thing. The only drawback is that it wasn't for everybody. It was for people, you know, with the skill and the knowledge to, to read and decipher the Lucasa board. But I think my point is really that Africa has had innovation and ingenuity dating way back. And so as a, as a creative person, you know, an artist, I think what drives me is music. And uh, this is the music of some of the people that, uh, as some of the people whose music shaped and, and formed me as, a, as, a, as an artist, as a creative designer. Miles Davis and John Coltrane. I mean, we know them together as a force, but when they went apart, I think John Coltrane just took it to another level, a very, very high level, uh, that spoke of the pain that uh, African Americans feel in America. And we can say that the same for Nina Simone. And Sister Rosetta Pope created rock and roll. People say Chuck Berry and all these other men, but actually it was Rosetta, Sister Rosetta Pope, who is the creator of rock and roll. In Africa, it's Fela and Akulapo Kuti, very, very vocal against uh, African politi uh, politicians, corruption. Jimi Hendrix, well, he took the guitar, turned it upside down and created just like nobody has been able even to emulate. And Sun Ra was just from another planet in terms of jazz and the music that he composed. Bob Marley, uh -huh. well, Bob Marley was uh, born in the ghettos of uh, Kingston, Jamaica, but he is one of the, today, when you talk about musicians that really um, made a statement on the on a global stage, Bob Marley is way up there, standing for the rights of the uh, downtrodden. We can't talk about that without talking about Jean Michel Basquiat, who was belittled in life when he was alive. His work was uh, dismissed as mere graffiti, but in death, his paintings are now selling in the hundreds of millions of dollars. So, go figure. In America, you have Sequoia, whom I think is an American icon but he hasn't had his day in terms of like being recognized for being the first person in the history of humanity to create a writing, sim a writing system single-handedly, the Cherokee script. So I'll end with um, this slide, which I shot at uh, CHOP, which uh, started as uh, CHAZ in Seattle. And I was passing by the police station and I saw this and I just had to shoot this. And I think the words, the two words that drove me to it were empathy and solidarity. And my question is, how long will America ignore the rights of native people? You know, yes, we know Black Lives Matter, but I think that Native lives matter as well. And, and those two, in terms of like, um, when you talk about Black Lives Matter, you have to talk about Native Lives Matter because you can't separate the two. It's exactly the same thing. Native people of America have suffered the same violence, genocide, even worse, they suffered genocide. So. I think that empathy and solidarity are the two driving uh, forces here. So that's it. Thank you very much. Awesome. Thank you, Saki. And um, can everyone hear me okay? Awesome. Um, so 
Again, my name is Sadie Redwing. I am an enrolled citizen of the Spirit Lake Dakota Nation, which is located in Fort Totten, North Dakota. And also half my family is from the Cheyenne River Lakota Nation uh, within Central South Dakota. And I currently work at the American Indian College Fund, which is in Denver, Colorado, where I am as a student success coach and have responsibilities of making sure Native American students have the resources they need to achieve their goals and their higher education journeys, um, as well as um, conducting greater research within uh, design with specific of including indigenous perspective in academia here in the United States. Um, so I'm gonna, because we only have 15 minutes here, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. And, um, and I'm very thankful and happy that um, Saki was able to, um, you know, share some slides that transition into what I have to share today. And I kind of want to start my portion of the conversation um, sharing this news article. I don't know if anybody has seen in the past month or so or uh, came across articles on social media. If you have it, I encourage you to, especially if you're interested in the topics of decolonization in the United States and wanting to learn more about sovereignty. But the eastern half of the state of Oklahoma has um, turned over uh, land sovereignty rights to the tribes who occupy areas of eastern um, Oklahoma. So that is wonderful news, especially within uh, Native American communities here, because it's showing proof that um, change is happening. The giant who is sleeping, he's slowly turning and he's starting to wake up. And, um, and just to know that, you know, what happened in Oklahoma, that could be possible for other tribes. So as I mentioned, um, I kind of I come from the Dakotas area within the Great Plains and the Midwest within the country and a lot of uh, our tribal communities are fighting for sovereignty, which reflects in these uh, treaties, the treaties that allow these sovereign nations to occupy specific fates, specific places here in the United States. Um, but just to kind of give reference that um, a lot of this activism and advocacy speaks, doesn't matter what field it is, um, it speaks to wanting these treaties to be recognized. And I wanted to kind of point out this date, this 1868 Fort Laramie Treaty. And um, one thing that here in the United States, it's hard to comprehend or something that's hard to unlearn is the concept of time. And when some people see this, uh, a date from the 1800s, it's hard to imagine, um, it's hard to put yourself in that position. It seems like so long ago, but in honesty, it's not that long ago, but also to it demonstrates how long, um, you know, these, the Lakota and Nakota and Dakota tribes or um, previously known as the Sioux, um, how long we've been in this uh, battle for wanting recognition. And if, if what happened in Oklahoma were to happen in South Dakota, um, the western half of South Dakota would be uh, Lakota territory, which if you've seen in the news, we had um, Trump coming to Mount Rushmore or the Sturgis rally been going on. Um, a lot of those experiences do not practice or reflect um, the occupants of the Lakotas. Um, hence, you might have seen a lot of protesting in the media uh, with those two events, but I needed to kind of give reference of um, where this idea of uh, decolonization in the occupants of land is going and where it's at now in 2020 and how it's affected by us demographics um, who are currently affected by colonial or colonization here. And I've been my voice has been prominent in this word, and as Saki mentioned, these words have become buzzwords, but I feel that some of these words have been taken out of context and been put in conversations without um, the, the true meaning. And I may have been, and I may seem outspoken in, um, in saying that as a researcher or somebody who is creating resources, materials that are used um, for research on the term decolonization. You here in the United States, you're conducting this research, but you have no reference of an indigenous perspective, um, reference citation of how that's 
um, being affected in the United States, um, those materials that you're creating, they're not benefiting the demographics of the students that need uh, materials within that demonstrate what decolonization is. And I'm seeing a lot of this within the design communities, but I'm happy that these conversations are happening, that we can talk about the difference between decolonization, decolonialism, and then put these words in conversation to have context. And I know many designers and advocates and educators are wanting to create more inclusive spaces and want to demonstrate this a little bit more, but I still think they don't have the understanding of how it affects the indigenous designers, students, and educators who need these research materials the most. So when I begin to bring um, this word colonization in decolonization, let's say into a classroom space, I really detail the meaning and practice based on this verb this occupiance of space, this forced group of settlement onto actual land, territory, region, environment, space, you name it, um, compared to, uh, let's say, an idea, but again, referencing this, this, um, this need for greater sovereign nation, or sorry, greater sovereign action of occupying space is where a lot of these tribal nations are fighting right now. And I'll, and as I get in, you know, for a couple slides down, I'll reference it to how design is affected by this as well. So to just, again, to get the students to have an understanding of, um, and Saki mentioned it too, is you want to talk about decolonization, but then do people have an idea of how, of what you're reverting back to? What, um, as a verb, how are you, if tribal communities are wanting to reoccupy, reclaim their land um, in the way that they demonstrate a tribe or a community, do people know what that looks like? Um, so to kind of start painting the picture of putting in performance in the means of occupying a space specific here to the United States of America. Now, I always have to open up and remind people that in the United States, there are over 570 federally recognized tribes, which means, and again, if you get on Google and you type how many federally recognized tribes there are in the United States, these numbers are going to vary. You'll see 573. Um, I've know I read data that said 576 here on the uh, Bureau of Indian Affairs website. They have a map and they say 578 plus, you know, 92, but then needing um, folks to remember that all the, a lot of these tribes are always in limbo when it comes to um, their, uh, if they are recognized as a federally sovereign nation. And sometimes people can't picture what it means to be a sovereign nation inside the United States of America. Now, a sovereign nation is a government that is able to function outside of the US government. So it's hard for people to imagine there's over 570 little tiny countries inside the United States. And it's tough to be within a demographic that is not recognized as that. And it's tough to be in a different, or it's tough to be not recognized at a national level. So kind of given an example, if we as Native or as the United States uh, sovereign nations, could enter into something like the FIFA World Cup. You know, why, why can't we right now, I mean, or, you know, we would hope to be at a presence that we can be recognized at a national level, but we do have um, a neighboring country, the United States, that um, provide us some trouble and um, some speed bumps in the way for us to, to, to perform at that level. Another reason why I want to show this map is because it splits up in regions and there might be and two things. One, one hard pill to swallow is that globally there are still large populations that think indigenous people do not exist. So me as in um, a lot of the tribes here, we are the ones that are, have the stress to wake up that people think that we don't exist. You know, that's tough sometimes, especially going into a space where you might be the first indigenous person somebody has ever seen. So to even note that um, we are existent, 
um, the 578 tribes here, but also to, to give an understanding of region. And as we get into this concept of how to visually represent sovereignty, you have to understand how land plays into those visual languages, how land plays into um, uh, demonstrating the sovereignty and the occu occupants and the resources and how we will function as a sovereign nation. The eastern, northeastern, southeastern region is completely different than the southwest region, completely different than the Great Plains region, um, great, completely different than the Arctic region. Um, and each of those regions provide resources, land resources, water resources, uh, flour, uh, food, uh, you name it. All of those resources um, influence our language, our verbal, visual, even body language, um, our tools, our technology, um, our understanding of the term reciprocity, and to know that to get out of this uh, stereotype of, um, you know, natives as being these quote unquote hippie land lovers, people forget that, you know, before contact, a lot of our words and our food and stuff derive from the land. And if we want to be in a position to revitalize that or renew some of our um, words, we need to be able to see that. So for example, if, uh, if we use a lot of, if in our, in the Lakota language, there's words for a lot of flowers within the prairie. Well, the farming came and destroyed a lot of those prairie flowers. We can't see what those flowers look like. So if I'm in a position to make a flashcard of a specific word, um, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to be able to do it unless there's a sketch or a depiction of it um, before farming um, came to the prairie and the grasslands area. So people kind of forget, again, this concept of time. So kind of moving in, getting an understanding of region, how you're gonna visually represent a region or visually represent sovereignty, aka visual sovereignty, is gonna vary based on the land. Again, this, this occupiant. So I'm coming from a Great Plains uh, pers uh, perspective, coming from a Lakota and Dakota um, dwellers of the prairie and have a large influence within land, uh, lakes and rivers within the Midwest, specifically the Missouri River. Um, here and the resources used, um, for example, I'll show in a second, like the, um, uh, you know, from the animals within the prairie, you got the buffalo, you got the porcupine, and, you know, uh, animal uh, parts that might make something like beads until uh, we were able to trade with Europeans to get finer glass beads. But a lot of those resources, um, depict on what type of symbols you can make. So if we're somebody who is using uh, more hard and sturdy uh, beads or materials to create some symbols, they're not going to have a flowy uh, um, calligraphy form line uh, aesthetic because uh, those resources can only create more right angle, more triangle, and um, kind of more basic shapes. So I wanted to give an idea to kind of show what my graphic design work looks like um, because it's rooted based on beadwork designs. Here I'm showing parfletch designs, um, which would be uh, animal hide with paints. So again, these dyes and our color palettes comes from um, either flowers or muds of you know specific dirts that can create some type of um, um, dyes and colors and a lot of them have traditional meanings to those colors or you will see different color palettes based on regions. Um, aside of this parfletch, this hide leather, leather design and also too I kind of want to give a just demonstrate how a parfletch design is different than a beadwork design which might be a little bit different than a quill work design, a porcupine quill. So traditionally porcupine quills were plucked um, so it's clean, dyed specific colors or flattened either with teeth um, and a wrapped and sewn in various ways. And um, obviously shown a lot of adornment and alongside uh, beadwork and quill work, I wanted to kind of give these two references, especially the one on the left or the one with the horses painted on the hide to demonstrate, you know, hide paintings. And some of these hide paintings can be reflected within our winter counts or our annual calendars, or some of these um, images on this hide painting can be seen within our ledger arts. You know, as the reservation period happened within the 1800s in the Midwest, um, we were introduced to, uh, you know, uh, 
a way of life that included rations that introduced this idea of what a ledger means to document things and how we incorporated the tool of a ledger as a form of um, documenting history you know for those history buffs who are interested in like the battle of little bighorn or other native american battles you may have a lot of uh, research within some of those wars depicted within our ledger arts or our hide paintings um, and then two, uh, the Dakota, you know, they um, may occupy more space along the um, Minnesota area in Minnesota, you know, has a little more of a, a woodlands landscape aside of a, a prairie landscape. And you might see a little bit more um, in, or in influence. You may see an uh, Anishinaabe floral work, but again, coming within thinking of like where Minnesota is and, and showing somehow that some of these floral characters, and I'll give an example of how it can be brought, some of these, these designs could be brought in a contemporary um, visual communication piece. So a quick history overview of um, how some of the conventions might look like in my work, but just to give the understanding of um, how some of this imagery can be brought into a visual communication piece that can, um, influence the space and these next examples these space are this occupiance within the land and environment especially here in um in south dakota is uh in the more of a higher education space i like to be a part of um definitely a lot of advocacy in higher education spaces and i like to be um definitely want to provide a more inclusive environment specifically for indigenous students um, my participation in, in um, higher education programs it's, has been, you know, phenomenal and I'm learning every day and um, to kind of show how to visually give identity to some of these programs has been challenging, but it's also been thriving and set an example of others who may be in positions to represent visual sovereignty. Um, I have this image of College Pride Native Pride, which demonstrates some beadwork designs um or using you know symbols like the uh the frog as uh as a metaphor for a student and it might be a little hard to dictate or pick out and notice that a lot of these um these uh, i guess uh, motifs or, or symbols you know represent flowers and seeing and using this term of the, or sorry using this image of the flower as um and able to define this idea of flourish. So we, on the um, other side here in this black and white, I'm working with uh, Hyphen Reads, which is a book publishing company in, uh, out of New Jersey. And um, Heather Lim, she is of Korean descent. She brought to my attention that, um, you know, there's not any text or resource within, you know, the North and South Korea that share indigenous culture. And that's one of the reasons why, um, you know, maybe areas in uh, Southern or Eastern Asia, um, they don't know a lot about Native American culture. So she's wanting to start translating indigenous literature and texts into, into um, Korean. And we're talking about phrases that are uplifting or phrases that I might use, let's say within higher education or wanting to boost confidence and leadership within um, my student demographic. And a, and a, um, a phrase I use is the Buffalo Nation will rise. So on the bottom and there, I kind of have uh, ledger style buffaloes bringing uh, the language Lakota in, um, in a, in a um, European influence um, alphabet and then using a floral uh, depiction to show that um, the buffalo ayate or the buffalo nation will rise and that flower shows the flourish or the rise or the blooming. Um, I want to uh, again kind of given this idea of the challenges that might come about in um, designing for a sovereign space um, that is affected by colonialism and it's tough. It's tough, especially when we start to get into type, we start to get into symbolism and we start to get into uh, representation of a culture that is not stereotypical. And I just kind of wanted to share a couple of challenges it has been as a Native American graphic designer and wanting to give identity to Native American spaces. So this Wheezy Pond is, um, 
is a student program that's uh, developed within the South Dakota State University. And it's not live at the moment, but because it is a Native American students um, program, it's gonna, um, you know, hold a space and even to branch within um, the Indian University of North America uh, uh, program within the Black Hills of South Dakota, there has to be reference of Lakota and Dakota um, influence to know that that's the, going to be that student's identity. So that program is called Wheezy Pond. It's a metaphorical use, or sorry, the definition actually translate to um, almost like a container. On here it says a, sash, a satchel, but something that holds. And it could be a word that reflects something like the Black Hills. As uh, Lakota, people, Lakota people, the Black Hills was a great container for us because it provided everything that we needed to live. Um, so to bring that word into a higher education space, the first thing that is challenging is the spelling. Um, elders like will get, uh, will get on to my generation and saying that our language wasn't meant to be spelt. And what is difficult is that the Lakota dictionaries and my grandma's in my grandma's generation is different than the dictionaries and my parents' generation is different than the dictionaries in my generation. So we have a lack of consistency. So speaking to Lakota designers who want to start um, revitalizing language, we have to develop a system that, that demonstrates consistency because it's extremely hard. It's hard to present um, this branding project to, let's say, South Dakota State, and some of that language is still intimidating to them. Or some, even too, you know, some of my students don't have the computers or may not be familiar to write in the unique, you know, dialectal characters. Um, but I want to just kind of get, you know, just kind of share if we are visually showing and using Lakota language and Lakota imagery, which here we have the parfletch designs, um, how we can start, you know, branding um, some of these spaces that are going to influence a Native American demographic. And if even these spaces start in higher education spaces, aside of tribal communities, we have to start somewhere and we have to demonstrate identity that's going to reflect um, that specific demographic. So this is just a couple of examples of um, some um, logo designs and some branding ideas that are going about and, you know, again, you, using um, using a phrase that's going to be feasible across the board to non-Indigenous and Indigenous students and incorporating uh, colors and some of these colors might have some traditional meaning to them. Um, I threw this, uh, this slide in here to kind of show, um, you know, as we're progressing uh, in our, our youth, our youth are really utilizing these online tools, especially during COVID and and doing and conducting webinars and podcasts and you know using social media and more um, positive influential leadership methods. Um, social media and, and um, online tools require you know some some visual communication and a visual communication that's going to demonstrate us. And this uh, this is actually a project that's coming out of Southern California with the uh, UC Riverside or in Riverside County. Riverside and San Bernardino County Indian Health Services, and they're having a podcast directed to health individuals who have who are non-native, but their patients are um, of native descent, and providing uh, greater competency skills in working. If you are non-native and you work as a um, as a physician or a nurse or a doctor, and you don't have that cultural knowledge of your patient you know, listen to this podcast that might provide you some, some um, greater learning. But just to kind of show if you were to put a person um, of Native American descent on there, how would you do it? So again, bring up another challenge is, well, how do you represent a specific region, territory, even gender? Um, and some examples of what that might include. It might include some floral designs. It might include some traditional adornment. Um, definitely you know, if you, uh, the image on my right, you know, the, the um, figure is a little bit more androgynous, but providing elements are non-stereotypical. These two uh, individuals do not have stereotypical features. They're um, showing greater beauty and more positivity and enlightenment to get away from those stereotypical images of, um, let's say, like a warrior or the 
the skull and the headdress or this word savage and um, you know bringing some progressively bringing a new narrative to these demographics that need it the most um, so again us and I remind I remind indigenous designers students or for those who are not indigenous and work um, in means of uh, representing other demographics that are not theirs the power of holding someone's language and holding somebody's identity is literally in your hands you are the one who's visually communicating this so you're the one who's given them proof of what it looks like so that's a really high power that sometimes is not respected so i want to reference what i just shared back to this article that i shared on my first slide and saying that as indigenous people are gaining their rights and their treaties are hopefully gonna be, all our treaties are hopefully gonna be acknowledged in the next years to come, we, we need the designers to be ready to visually represent those nations that are gonna acquire and occupy these, these land areas. And, um, and we need to do it in a way that is um, respectful and it's going to be appropriate and it needs to be sustainable and um, in having that in mind and being in the realm of higher education I constantly question and this question can be across the board it doesn't necessarily have to be within design but me as somebody who works in higher education I have to make my sure my students are ready to go back to their sovereign nations we have a lot of students who either um, they go out, they'll leave their communities and they'll go to mainstream colleges and the knowledge that they take from those colleges they're gonna bring it back to their communities. But then I question and I make, um, you know, other educators and advocates question is, the information and knowledge you're giving them, are they prepared to take that back to their sovereign nation? It's looking at design schools, are our design students ready to go back and design and visually represent for their sovereign nation? Are our classrooms and our curriculums getting them ready to introduce their languages into uh, more fonts that work in work doc Word document? Are they working on you know, getting their languages to work with uh, Amazon Alexa? Are we looking at how tribal or um, indigenous people constructed their tribes to protect the Grand Canyon or protect the Black Hills or protect the coast? Are we looking at how design can influence the revitalization of the buffalo, the salmon, and, um, or other animals? So I, we always get this question, um, you know, how can educators quote unquote decolonize their sil syllabus um, I don't, I kind of don't know what they mean in that sense, but the best way I can direct them is, well, where do you want your students to go? My students have to go back because soon our treaties are going to be recognized and we got to make sure that we can express our sovereignty 100%. So I, we got to make sure our, our upcoming generations are ready for that. Um, but um, in, to end here and encompass this, this term decolonization, we're still, and me as an educator and the root of the work that I do, it's still about occupying our land and mine specifically within the Great Plains. I'll stop right there. So thank you. Thank you, Sadie, and, and, and thank you, Saki. Um, despite some discomfort in this space, I do want to speak just briefly to the voices that entered the space early on and, and offered uh, some violent and, and hateful uh, sentiment and words. I think that conversations and community require um, spaces of safety for trust and respect to emerge. So I offer, uh, you know, to, to those that are, that are attending, but uh, Saki and say to you, uh, words of sincere apology and gratitude for the contributions that you've made. Um, one thing I can also do uh, as I sit in, in the state of South Dakota with Sadie, though at a, quite a distance, uh, is to acknowledge that I'm sitting today on the traditional ancestral lands of the Osheti Shakoan people and pay my respect to their elders, both past and present, who have cared for this land specifically and, and the communities of people that have called it home throughout the generations. Um, I am uh, so humbled and thrilled, I think, to uh, be able to even in a, the br very brief time we have together <laughs> remaining, uh, speak to some of these incredible themes of time and space and place and, and, uh, and, and tradition. Um, 
Saki, one of, one of the things that you, you, you pointed to early on that I think I'd love to kind of open the space for both of you to speak to. Um, I, I was not familiar with the word Sankofa and had seen it in your uh, presentation deck in advance and so had sought out uh, definition myself. And uh, you shared the idea of living from the past. Uh, an alternate um, Aachen uh, 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 translation that I read said, uh, that Sankofa could be interpreted to mean it is not taboo to go back and fetch what you have forgotten, which I think is stunning. Uh, uh, there's something uh, so deeply resonant in that. I'm curious if you could speak, uh, and, 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 and Sadie, I very much feel like um, uh, your work is also grounded in this idea of uh, the, the future emerging by, by, by seeking the past and rediscovering and, and, and uh, revealing uh, the past. Could you speak to that dichotomy a little bit, Saki and Sadie, of, of what it is to be someone that is in many ways innovating and in, as many, in many ways is uncovering and revealing and remembering? Uh, it seems that there's a, a real challenge in, in doing both of those at the same time. Um, that's really kind of like the cornerstone of my teaching philosophy, really. And I use it even to when I teach American uh, students, um, because I feel like we all are from somewhere, right? Even in a family uh, setting, you have your grandparents and in America, most people are not from America, <laughs> unless you're Sadie Red Wing, <laughs> you know? So, so I always encourage my students like to talk to their grandparents like, okay, so where did they come from? And if they're Italian, I say, did you ever speak to your uh, grandparents, your grandmother, you know, before coming to America, what, was their, what were their lives like? Because that's what shapes who you are today, you know? And, um, but for me, Sankofa, as somebody who went through, I lived in, in a colonized setting. Oh, shoot, we may have lost you briefly, Saki. Um, give him just a moment to, to, uh, to return and I'll, I'll, I'll prompt that. But Sadie, would you, uh, is that, uh, would you feel comfortable st stepping in and, and sharing perhaps the balance that I hear? I hear in, in you, um, and, and please tell me if I'm, I'm, I'm projecting, um, but the optimism of a return to full uh, tribal sovereign, sovereignty in a respected and acknowledged and honored way is a hopeful perspective of the future, uh, and, 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 and hope-filled at least. Uh, and and I'm, I'm curious to hear of that balance of, of both living from, not living in the past, but living from the past, and also defining that that future. Yeah, I think um, I think some people. It's kind of hard to picture. It's kind of hard to picture. As Saki was referencing, that um, if you don't have an image of your history, you know, let's say in the last five hundred years, it's hard to envision the balance of these two concepts. And I think when people are picturing in their minds of um, indigenous tribes wanting to uh, revitalize. I think they have it in their head that they, we want to uh, get rid of these buildings, go back to teepees and wigwams, or they just have this, this fantasized idea. But in reality, we know that um, we know the concept of incorporating and adapting technology, um, not necessarily appropriating it because we know the origins of where they come from. But in the idea of what makes a sovereign nation functioning, you know, we need uh, clinics, schools, um, we need a, a, a functioning language, even something like a currency. Here in the United States, um, tribal nations are required to have a tribal ID. Well, who designs that ID? Um, but the hard part is that when I wanna use my ID um, outside of, uh, let's say um, I have a spirit like Dakota ID, if I want to use it at, um, let's say I'm buying, uh, if I'm buying a drink at Buffalo Wild Wings and I have to talk to the manager every time I want to use my tribal ID because they don't see it as a recognized um, form of identification, um, you know, that's still a problem for us. You know, all these tribes are able to have their own form of currency. Well, I don't think the United States is ready to accept 570 plus forms of currency. 
who's going to design that currency? Who's going to design the infrastructure of these banks? So it's hard for people to um, think about this idea of um, having indigenous people be sustainable on what we have now. And it's just difficult if we want to revitalize some of these languages. Well, a lot of these words are created, you know, pre settlers, pre colonial existence. So if we want to have them in our everyday language, but we can't see them, we're not going to use some of these words, hence them being lost. So these are just kind of the challenges that we're having. And some people just because they're not familiar with the language and they're, they, they don't have this idea of um, of indigenous society modern day because we're such we're stuck in this fictionalized image. Um, this is this is where these conversations come up. But um, just to know that um, we're working on uh, getting past what the U.S. government holds us back from, but then also too we need our neighboring neighbor, the United States of America, to be ready when we're ready to introduce um, these. Uh, these structures and forms and businesses and you name it um, that are invented and created by indigenous nations. That's right. Saki, I see you've, I see you've joined us. Uh, I want to, I don't know if you wanted to, to wrap up your thought. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, what I was, what I want to say is that like uh, when like the process of colonization, right. When your subjugator kind of like, um, um, well, sort of like, I guess, comes into your space and subjugates you. The first thing is to really destroy your psyche so that they can subjugate you. So for me, the strength, our strength lies in the pre-colonial era um, uh, achievements that we 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 have, and like the Great Zimbabwe is, is is such an example, you know. So for young people, you know, especially young people coming up today, uh, they have bought into that narrative that well, you were nothing, you don't know anything, you never contributed anything to humanity, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So your strength come comes from going to your past, to the Sankofa, and learning from that past. And that, that's what gives you the confidence, you know? That's what gives you that, that strength to say, I am somebody, you know, and I have these achievements, you know? These, we, we also were creators of amazing architecture, you know, amazing design. Design has always been there in Africa and everywhere in other parts of the world. You know, design is not like a Western uh, 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 concept, right? And I think that even when I came to America to study, I thought graphic design was something that uh, we didn't have. Yeah. It was something that I had to learn, right? And so when I went to Yale and I was being taught by Paul Ryan and all these luminaries, right? I was like, I got it made. I'm learning from the best designers on the continent, on, on, in the world, you know? But it only took like going into New York, you know, to work and people, you know, kind of like questioning my portfolio, like a Swiss portfolio and an African designer, there's a disconnect here, right? And it, initially I didn't get it. I was actually insulted. Like you questioned me, I went to Yale, I was educated by Paul Rand. How come you have the nerve to question me my my work, right? But when I got it, when when it clicked, it was Sankofa all the way. Mm. Indeed. Well, it's amazing what we can accomplish with technology, but it's also amazing sometimes the limitations. Um, this is a, actually a remarkable segue, which is my curiosity that uh, that I was going to explore next, Sadie, is a question of 
uh, I think it's easy to guess or uh, or, or uh, assume what's lost in um, in a uh, transition of technology being introduced into spaces. Um, we we can assume that you know the written word uh, adapts and changes the way that language happens that was primarily verbal. We can look to um, uh, the loss of of you know hand uh, crafting of design for the computers. Uh, my, my curiosity actually is more along the lines of what's gained as you, as you look at students and as you look at your own work, what you believe is gained in the, the tool set that you have in 2020 versus the tool set that have, may have existed 2000 years ago um, based on extraordinary natural life or natural um, uh, uh, process. Uh, do you have a sense of, of, of that for your own work? Yeah, um, I... I'm, yeah, I'm going to reference this, this answer based on um, a computer science class I taught at the Indian University of North America. Um, but just to know who I'm targeting in my work, who I'm targeting in my voice, it's, um, it's the Native American students. Um, these, these, uh, these brilliant kids who um, can grasp on to uh, future trend technology quick. And we see it on social media. We see down their interests of something like coding. Um, we're seeing um, where their interests are on what, uh, um, what objects they might want to have, whether it be like, let's say something like Alexa or um, them starting to question what artificial intelligence is capable of doing, what augmented reality is capable of doing and what um, uh, you know, uh, virtual reality is, is, is doing. So, now that students are really interested in wanting to to learn um, or kind of get into this this you know kind of futuristic you know, technology sometimes it's a little bit hard coming from a rural area but to know that you can get on youtube and learn anything you can get on you know depending if, you know someone has access to the internet and 4g service um, but once uh, once you give those resources to a Native American students, man, where can they take them from, take them to? And some of the things that we kind of talk about, so talk about gaining, um, you know, let's say, you know, more uh, tribal communities, reservations, more sovereign nations want to bring artificial intelligence onto their lands and helping um, uh, bring back some buffalo farming, bring back some traditional crop growing, well, I make my students question, well, who is programming this technology and who is putting the knowledge in this technology? And if indigenous perspective is not included into that technology and it's gonna be used on our land in, in, um, in sustain, uh, for sustainability or environmental um, related issues, um, then I try to get my students to push on that's where you need to be. You need to start questioning and how you can start introducing your traditional ecological knowledge, TEK, into a lot of um, these future trends, because that's going to help us. That's going to help us get an idea of um, how we want to bring back some of our traditional foods, um, or even to just there's so much uh, research going on within the environmental justice uh, regions or water preservation or cleanliness and just um, we just need more indigenous populations and knowledge included into some of this research so that um, they can bring it back and for it to be beneficial for us or even to um, you know one area that I'm really trying to push students into thinking about is this um, learning how tribes structure their tribes in a way of protecting in um, continuing fruitful reciprocal living to keeping this land living. Um, and it's a design, it's a science, it's a traditional knowledge that we have. And the more that we can incorporate these tools that we're learning and using in 2020 and even doing it in a way that's in our phone or it's at our computers, like the, um, you know, the revitalization is possible. It's just, um, navigating um, the questions of perspective to the right places. Saki, the, 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 the question that I had was, um, and, and you spoke to this uh, over the long arc as well, 
of there are many that belabor kind of the loss that comes with technology that you lose. Uh, you know, I'm certain when, when you were at Yale, you weren't using computers uh, at that point. Nope. Uh, there, you know, and, and so I, I'm, my curiosity uh, that, that Sadie was just speaking to is with um, individuals like the students at the Zimbabwe Institute, um, how, how does, what, what are the benefits that you've seen in terms of the, the, the technologies and tool sets and how they've actually either amplified or accelerated or, or broadened and expanded the, the, the exploration of the processes that you're teaching? Well, I think that um, um, the, the, technology, the technologies are just tools, really. And I think uh, Sadie spoke to that at length in terms of like, okay, so there's artificial intelligence, augmented reality, all this stuff, right? But what she's saying, what she's stressing, which, which is what I, I'm getting and agreeing to and nodding my head to, is that she tells her students that this must benefit the, the people, right? It, it, they, should, they shouldn't just learn the, the technology for technology's sake, right? The, it really must, it must come back and also advance the, um, the, the, um, the lot of the people. Mm -hmm. So the same thing with me, like animation, for instance, right? I tell them, okay, there is Disney and there's um, all these studios, okay? What stories are they telling? you should be concentrating on your stories, okay? We want our stories to go out there also, just as Disney has pushed all this stuff at us, we also want to push our stories, our narratives uh, back at them, right? So the emphasis is really like, okay, learn the, the, um, the technology, learn how to do it. But in terms of content, it really must benefit us. We should tell our stories from our own voices. Yeah, that that that's the, the, the what you just spoke to. I think is the the last question I have, given given the time and 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 uh, given the challenges we've had. Um, and and Sally Ann was in the comments and asked a variant on this question, so I want to acknowledge her 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 asking that, which is to ask, where have you found? Uh, connection between each other's research. It seems that uh, as, as someone from the outside, there are a lot of areas of connection and resonance, but do the two of you see resonance in your work, either visually or emotionally or, or historically, that it emerges as you listen to each other present? In all, the, all of the above. <laughs> I mean, when I spoke to Sadie the first time, you know, that we, we kind of like met, um, met, you know, kind of like virtually, I think we almost spoke, spoke for two hours. And that was because the, the uh, synergies were just too, too, too powerful, you know? Like, of course we share this, we have this shared background of uh, colonization, right? But in the, for instance, she talked about the, um, the porcupines, you know, are the bees made out of porcupine quills? Well, my totem is porcupine. So when I, when we, we, we riffed on that, you know, we went off on that, just like, oh my God, you know, when you talk porcupine, you're actually talking about my essence because your totem is really who you are in terms of the, uh, the, the, the African uh, uh, culture. So, we, I think we, 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 we agreed on so many, um, so many areas that uh, I can't say it was just like philosophical or, or it was just like everything. We, I, I just, you know, Sadie and I just like, it was like magical, really. That first conversation that we had, you know, was just like amazing. So every time I listen to her, I'm like, oh my God, yes, of course, you know. And I think um, the truth is, um, the opposite is true for her also. Yeah, um, we, you know, I had a pleasure to uh, do, conduct a workshop at Art Center in California with uh, Saki. And um, I think what is 
what is um, what is nice is that I can we can have a conversation without the explanation of where this meaning is coming to. So we can get right to the point in um, in the in expressing um, our issues, concerns, how we're how we're doing certain something a certain way, um, where our motivations lie, where our goals lie, and I think what has been helpful for me as um, you know to to see Saki's work in, um, in in two ways. One, to see what he's accomplished in his life and um, provide mentorship on how I can um, follow those footsteps and bring um, some of his accomplishments into my own territories as well. But then also too, he gives me a larger understanding, a global view of um, how I may be interpreted or represent represented a nationwide and meaning that, um, you know, for him to be present and ask whoever he's speaking to, do you guys think about the indigenous people when you're in um, your design classroom? Mm. Um, and to learn that some of the response he gets, um, you know, they'll say not really, um, those are things I need to know. And those are things I had to be aware of in where my voice needs to be educating people. So, um, so I really appreciate that relation. And, um, and then even too, you want to be talking about something that might be a little, talking about uh, either a visual language or imagery, design, you name it, that may be looked on quote unquote primitive, um, quote unquote ancient um, and needing to know uh, more needing to know more background and knowledge and how to defeat some of those words. Um, I definitely look um, to Saki and in in in, um, in help on how to how do you tackle uh, those words when they don't demonstrate your actual presence and identity. Well, I going to leave it at that. I, I'm, I'm grateful that the two of you, your work has found uh, resonance and intersection and connection. And uh, I'm just humbled to be able to spend a little time today. Uh, Sadie, as always, uh, uh, to see you and, and, and celebrate uh, your work. Uh, and Saki, for the first time, it's great, great to meet you as well. Um, I'm going to pass things to Alden with Design for America to, to wrap it up. Thanks, you. And first and foremost, um, I just want to extend again, sort of mirror what he was saying in the beginning. Um, and a sincere apologies to Saki and Sadie and all of everyone who was watching for sort of the violence that was experienced in that Zoom call that we were in. Um, it really gives me and DFA pause to also think about like, yeah, what are the spaces that we're creating for these conversations to happen? Um, but I also wanna thank Saki and Sadie and Hugh and Civilization and all of the participants who joined us uh, on the YouTube for also refusing that space of violence and for so quickly pivoting to come together and still create this space where we can share with each other and learn from each other and have these conversations. Um, it really just means the world to sort of all of us to be here with you all. So thank you deeply. Um, it has been a strange, but also really powerful way to close out this DFA Spark series um, with civilization. And we'll be back in September, in October, in the fall to continue these conversations um, this recording will be available on our YouTube page for folks to go back and reference. Um, and yeah, we're excited to uh, continue these conversations with all of you. Again, Sa Saki, Sadie, thank you deeply. Um, it's been fantastic. And we'll see you all uh, again soon. Absolutely. Thank, thank you. you.